peace love and light everybody it's your girl morgan renee myers tuning in with you all for the last two chapters of feeding the soul because that's my business by tabitha brown this has been a great book very encouraging motivational great quotes recipes she now has a book out called cooking from the spirit so this book is about a year old if i'm not mistaken um, and now she has an actual cookbook out. So shout out to Tabitha Brown from Eden, North Carolina. Auntie Tab, America's mom. Um, for those that don't know, she's a vegan influencer, actress, comedian, and just overall amazing personality. So we're on chapter 29 entitled Create Your Village. Um, it starts off with a quote by Alex Haley that reads, In every conceivable manner, the family is a link to our past, a bridge to our future. Family is everything to me. Like my dad taught me early on, it is the foundation of everything you do. It's just like building a house. If you construct a home with no foundation, it's going to fall every time. But if you have a foundation, a storm could come blow your whole house over and the foundation will still be there. You could rebuild the home exactly as it was, or even better. I learned about the power of strong family bonds when my mom was sick. I shared with you already our journey in navigating our feelings about how to take care of my mother. That experience taught me so much about patience and expectations and how to love no matter what. But there's another part of this experience that is just as important. Sometimes we have to create our own family. When I was traveling back and forth from California to North Carolina to care for my mama, Chan stayed in California with our baby girl. Our created family was a huge support system during that time. While I was away, this extension of our family, this village, was there to help my husband take care of our daughter. That's how it's supposed to be, a village, a community. Having a village outside your immediate family is so important because you never know when life will take an unexpected turn. But if you have this village, if you have the support of both family and friends, you can trust that you have something holding you in place when the storms come. Their actions, whether it's babysitting or lending money or something else, certainly helps things run a little bit more smoothly, but their love will hold you up when you are feeling the weight of whatever loss or grief you're experiencing. I'm writing this book in the midst of a global pandemic. COVID-19 has created so much havoc and chaos in our lives with seemingly no end in sight. But even then, having a support system, someone to call on, can, can make all the difference in whether the isolation gets the best of us or not. My daddy is my best friend. Because he, li because he lives 3,000 miles away, I don't get to see him very often. The pandemic has now made traveling as freely as I might have in the past out of the question, so those daily phone and FaceTime calls are everything. I look forward to those little nuggets of wisdom he gives me. It's like a lifeline. Having blood family as a support system is such a blessing. Even with me pursuing my career, my cousins, aunts, and uncles have always been very supportive and encouraging. I'm sure they thought I was crazy with all my dreams and whatnot, but they still cheered me on. But I also understand that not everyone is blessed with that blood family who can hold them up in that way. So, as you go on your life journey, be discerning about the people in your life who could potentially be a part of your village. Don't be afraid to make your own family. Life could have been more difficult without our L.A. family. It's hard for me to even call them friends because they are really like brothers and sisters to me. My kids refer to them as aunts and uncles. Whether blood or found family, sometimes you need to know that you have somebody who's going to have your back if anything goes down. Knowing you have that is so healing to the soul. I used to host dinners at my house every Sunday. It didn't matter if we were in our little Baldwin Hills apartment or one of the two houses we eventually moved to. I'd bring my southern flavor and hospitality and throw down on a big meal for our found family. This was BV before vegan. So you were likely to find all kinds of down home soul food on the table. This was even more important to me because as an actor, I'd run into all kinds of people at classes or in workshops who didn't have any family in LA. They'd come here just like I did to pursue a dream. I wanted them to feel like my husband, daughter, and me were their family. So I'd say, y'all come on over Sunday, I'm cooking. And they came. Some people would bring their own dishes and we'd have a wonderful time. This is how we created family and it was a beautiful thing. Many of those same people who started coming to my Sunday dinners 15 or 16 years ago still come to my house right now, although not every Sunday these days, to eat all my vegan goodies. 
The village my husband and I created has been the most powerful representation of love and care I've seen. It's hard to be somewhere knowing that your blood family is all the way across the country and meeting new people can be intimidating. But if you're open to it, if you're open to what can come from those new relationships, it is so rewarding. I know so many families like mine who had one person who sort of kept everything and everyone together. For me, it was my grandma, Etta. Grandma Etta, my father's mother, had 12 kids and kept up with everyone. Woo! That's how my grandparents uh, did on my mother's and daddy. Uh, my daddy talked about my mother's mother and her daddy. They parents had like 12, 13, 15 kids. I was like, good God. For one woman. Woo! For me, it was my grandma Etta. She, that's my father's mother. Had 12 kids and kept up with everyone. 10 out of those 12 children had their own children and their children had children. Yet somehow Grandma Etta managed to make you feel like you were her only one. She was connected with each of us in her own special way. Every Sunday, we had what felt like a family reunion at Grandma Etta's house. After church, we all got together and ate dinner and fellowship with each other. This is where we all caught up on what everyone was doing or what someone needed. The family was very close and still is. My grandmother has been gone now for 20 years, but though she passed away, my family still continues to spend holidays together. They do Sundays once a month, and even though I live all the way out in Los Angeles and don't get to participate much, it does my heart good to know that the family is still connecting, connecting with each other in that way. They still have that day where they say, we're going over this cousin's house or that cousin's house. Everyone continues to stick together, just like when my grandma was alive. But for some people, when a matriarch or patriarch passes away, the family begins to fracture. Their death causes separation in the family and allows for old hurts and unresolved secrets to come to the surface and cause problems. Honey, it shouldn't be that way. We have to try to make things right within our families. Our grandparents, mothers, and fathers often do a phenomenal job in holding us together. You know, that ain't everybody's story, Dad, but I, I see what she's saying. But when God calls them home, that doesn't mean the family should be scattered and divided. We are supposed to try to do our best to stick together and love each other just like they taught us. Maybe your mother or father has passed and you haven't talked to your sister or brother since the funeral. Or maybe your grandmother is gone and your cousins haven't kept in touch. Maybe there was some confusion and frustration over a will or an inheritance. Nothing is worth separating yourself from the love of your family, baby. Family is so important. Having a village support and hold you, what having a village to support and hold you up is critical. Yes, you might have to create your own village for any number of reasons, but if you have blood family and you know you all can work things out, then take the step to do just that. Nobody's family is perfect. Everybody has problems, but they are still your family, and it's worth trying. Ask yourself, why haven't I talked to my sister? Why don't I know what's going on with my brother? Why doesn't my family get together anymore? Why don't we even call and check in on each other? Now, by no means am I saying let anyone hurt you with toxicity, but if you feel it's a situation that can be healed, try to make it right. I know, life is happening at lightning speed right now. We all got a lot going on, but if you are intentionally trying not to see your family, unpack the reason for that. Make sure you're clear. What are you mad about? You know good and well that your grandma or mama or daddy or whoever was the glue for your family would be upset if they knew that the family wasn't taking care of each other. Let's get back to loving each other. Not from a distance. I mean up close. Let's go see each other. Check on each other. Sometimes I think that's all we need. Let's tap into the spirits of our grandmas and great grandmas and granddaddies, aunts and uncles. It feels good when you have family and it feels even better when you're together. There's somebody out there who doesn't have family, who has to create one, not because they are far away like me, but because they literally don't have anyone left. They are wishing they had someone they could call. So think about that, all right? Even if they cut up and act a fool sometimes, they are still your family and you are part of them. Go fix that thing. Well, all right, Tab. That was Creative Village, chapter 29. Now we're on chapter 30. There's always a way. Last chapter of the book, guys. Starts off with a quote from Toni Morrison from her book, Song of Solomon. It says, when you know your name, you should hang on to it. For unless it is noted down and remembered, it will die when you do. My mother passed away of the neuromuscular disease, ALS, also called Lou Gehrig's disease. If you're not familiar with ALS, let's just say it's a rare condition that comes out of nowhere. 
It's not particular at all about who it chooses and it can strike anybody. My mother was a social worker and later on in life, a pastor. But everything shifted dramatically in the years between her diagnosis and her transition. The disease usually starts in a limb. It attacks your muscles, putting them to sleep. When that happens, your brain can't get the message to them to do whatever they need to do. So if it starts in your foot, you'll lose your ability to walk. From there, the illness spreads and eventually captures the organs. With mama, it started in her hands. She knew something was not right. Her right hand would get weak and twitch and she couldn't use it anymore. It just wouldn't move. Months later, it went to her right foot and then the entire right side of her body. But here's part of why I'm sharing this with you. When my mom, who was working on a memoir at the time, lost the use of, of her writing hand, she didn't put her pen down. In a matter of weeks, she taught herself to write with her left hand. When she could no longer write at all, she asked us to get a tape recorder because she was still able to talk and she wanted to record herself. My mother was determined to write her story. She was dedicated to the process of getting it all out and it didn't matter that her body was shutting down on her. She was going to make a way. She would always say, I can't die with this stuff inside of me. It needs to live long after I'm gone. I got my persistence, honestly. A few days before Mama passed, she mouthed to me, she couldn't talk any longer, so we read her lips, that she wanted me to be sure to get the box. The box was filled with all her tapes and journals, everything she wanted to share. I did what she asked, and I still have that box to this day. But a week after my mom passed, I tried to listen to one of the tapes, and I couldn't. I suppose it was too soon. I even tried to read some of her journals early on, and it was all a bit too much at the time. It took me nearly 12 years to open that box again. I had an urge to listen and was at one point in my and was at one point in my life when I wasn't going to ignore those urges. The first problem I faced though were the tapes. By then nobody was walking around with a tape player, but I eventually found a cassette player and decided to revisit with a listen. Three minutes into the first tape and I shut it off quickly. My mother was praying. Her voice was sweet but powerful. It was like music to my ears, but I hadn't heard it in more than 12 years. She had such a delicate tone, a true lady in every way. I fell into tears because I missed her, yes, but also because I was thankful that she took the time, made a way out of no way, to leave her voice with me. It didn't matter if she had to poke the record button with a pencil she picked up with her mouth. She persisted. I turned the tape player back on and listened to my mother praying and giving praise. It was clear that she was in a state of gratitude. She knew she was going to die. She been given the prognosis and told you are sick there's nothing we can do to make you better this disease is terminal yet she was thankful she started listening listing the things she was grateful for and one of them was the fact that she just left california this was not long after chance and i had moved to la well i got to go to california stay with my baby daughter tabitha my son-in-law chance and my grandbaby choice I had to get out there because I got to see where my baby is going to be. I got to see where she's going to be at because the Lord has called her out there for something. Out of the piles and piles of cassette tapes I could have chose to listen to, I picked that one up. God is always on the job, that's for sure. She went on to talk about the pain she was enduring emotionally with my stepfather. As I shared earlier, he wasn't dealing with her illness well. He couldn't handle it. And because of that anger, he became distant and unlike himself. But even still, despite living with that, she expressed her gratitude. The posture of her heart until the day she took her last breath was thankfulness. Listen, nobody wants to get sick. Nobody wants to have to rely on someone else to take care of their basic needs. But it can certainly be frustrating for caregivers. But be kind. People are just happy to be alive. Our kindness fuels their gratitude and hopefully our own. Instead of allowing grief and anger to have the last say, Enjoy those last days, months, or years with your loved one. Spend that time with them. I think Mama was determined to tell her story because she knew something I didn't at the time. Despite knowing she was going to die, she used to say, Girl, people going to know my name. Well, Mama, I believe so, I respond. Because you're going to see to it, she say back to me. I didn't get it at the time. I couldn't catch the prophecy in her words, but now I know what she was saying. My mama's name is Patricia Blackstock Johnson. She was amazing and strong. Baby, when everything and everyone is telling you that you can't do something, there's still a way. When you feel like you've tried everything, there's still a way. When you get to the crossroads and start feeling like you can't do it, but you can't figure out what's next, I want you to whisper this to yourself. Patricia Blackstock Johnson. 
I want you to remember that if Tab's mama can put a pencil in her mouth to hit record on her tape recorder, what can you not do? When there's a will, there's a way. All you have to do is have the willpower to keep going. Even when it looks like it's going to be over the storm, it's too powerful, honey. Stay in a state of gratitude to give God praise in advance. When my mama left this world, she was at peace. I'd never seen a person so at peace in my life. She told us the day she was going home, and she was at peace about it. She was right. People do know her name. You know her name. Her name is now a mantra and a scripture in the mouths of so many who are going to choose not to let their spirits be troubled, who are going to choose gratitude and peace. And for that alone, I give thanks. Thanks, Mama. Oh, that was beautiful. A final TSA tab service announcement. So you've done the work, right? You let the negative mindset behind. You even let go of some people who didn't have your best interests at heart. You're pressing toward your dreams and while you're waiting for them to come true. And you're working while you're waiting for them to come true. You've got a village in place. And maybe things are starting to happen for you. I'm so happy for you. I really am. But there's one more thing. God didn't take you on that journey so you can keep it to yourself. You didn't go through those ups and downs so you can just sit on it and not share it to help someone else. This ain't the point of living. That ain't the point of living. I know that part of the purpose God has I know that part of the purpose God has given me is to help save lives. That's my assignment. I want to do that by helping folks eat healthier and be kind to themselves and others. We've got to do better by our bodies, baby. And Tab is called to do that work. But if in the process of doing that my life starts to change just as it has and I don't tell you how I got here, well then I'm not doing right by my assignment. I'll go as far as to say I will be a hypocrite. God is still in the healing business. I know it's easy to think that God isn't healing the way it says he did in the Bible or other sacred texts. But listen, God is the same yesterday, tomorrow, and today. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I remember one day when back I far, back when I first started doing videos, I heard in my spirit a message that I couldn't let go. God didn't want me to write it in a Facebook post. He didn't want me to wait and deliver it some other way. He wanted me to go live right that instant, and so I did. In that message, I shared my story of God healing me after a year and seven months of pain. I talked about how I prayed to God for healing and committed to submitting my life to him if he did. I stood there in front of however many thousands of people who had logged in and testified about the healing power of God. I don't know why there was such an urgency or why I felt like I had to go live right then, but it was my business to be obedient to the feeling and spirit. I do believe that there was probably someone or even several someones who needed to hear my voice in that moment. They needed to know that despite chronic pain and sickness, they could be healed. Despite doctors not being able to figure out what was wrong or not having a clue how to proceed, God still heals. And yes, my story has to do with health, but there were probably a few folks who needed healing in their relationship or in their finances. They needed me to share my story and say over and over again, God is still in the healing business. They needed to know that their situation, whatever it was, didn't catch God off guard. It wasn't new to him. They might have been tired and thought they were just going to log on to get a few recipes or laugh with tab or something crazy happening with my family, but God met them through my story. Surrender your need to be in charge of your story. Somebody is waiting to receive God's healing through your words. Swallow that pride. Love yourself and others enough to share what God is doing. We must share the ways God's grace, mercy, and blessings show up in our lives. That's the mandate after we eat after we reach our goals after you stand in that mirror and speak life to yourself go on ahead and speak life to someone else the shift is happening for you i know you feel it you might not know that change is on the horizon you might just feel awfully uncomfortable or you may feel unexplainably excited that's the shift you've gotten in the car stepped on the gas and put everything in gear now god is showing out you are entering your winning season and i'm cheering for you so then, why in the world would you not share that with someone? There's someone watching you right now who is scared. They don't even want to get in the car. They are overwhelmed by life, just like you were a short time ago. Go bless them with your story. Pay the love forward. That's what we're here to do. And if you're still scared and feeling stuck, remember, this isn't as temporary, and it will pass. Hang on in there and keep on going. I love you. Tab is so sweet. That was nice. All right, I am going to read the acknowledgments because... 
I usually read the preface and the acknowledgments and stuff. She put it at the end of the book. So I'm going to just see who she's thankful to for writing this book. First and for, foremost, I just have to give thank. I just have to thank God for this moment. It feels surreal. I can't believe he has placed me on this journey, but I'm so grateful he has. Everything he took me through was for this day in this book. I am so forever thankful. Thank you to my husband, Chance, who has been right by my side through thick and thin, honey, through good and bad and sickness and any help. You have stayed by my side through it all. Now here we are able to reap the benefits and rewards of never giving up on each other and you never giving up on me thank you chance i love you babe to my children choice question and talia every day you make me a better woman a better mom and a better person i pray every day that mommy inspires you to grow up and be even better than i am may your dreams be bigger than mine and your lives full of abundant blessings i love you all that's so beautiful hearing these words from a parent to my sister tasha Shout out to Tasha. Tasha um, is who I gave my crochet earrings to when I went to her book tour for this book um, in September of last year. Uh, I didn't get to meet Tab, but she passed it along to her and Tab shouted me out on her um, story. So she's seen them um, and I also gave her some crochet uh, like hearts and stuff. So shout out to Tasha. Appreciate you, girl. Shout out to um, my sister Tasha, who is my right hand when my left is preoccupied, who does everything that I ever ask. I thank you. I love you for loving me and for just always being there there to my stepmom diane i thank you for loving me as your own i appreciate you to mama i know that my strength comes from you i know that the experience of your life helped shape my life today i thank god for you and i thank him for choosing me to be your child i will continue to carry the torch that you lit first i miss you and love you mama to daddy i am so very thankful that you are not only my daddy but my best friend the one who has always been an open ear for me but more than that you have always been my encourager my pusher the one who said i don't know how to get you to them dreams you got but we're going to help you and we're going to try and i'm going to always support you you are my everything daddy thank you and i love you to my team kyle santilio and clayton santilio at scale management cindy U and carlos Sagara at creative artist agency and my editor cassie jones and the whole william morrow team at harper collins thank you all so much for believing in me for trusting me and for confirming that i am enough Thank you for flying with me. I love you all. God bless you. To Tracy, uh, Michael, Lewis, Gidgets, I cannot even thank you enough. I absolutely love you. I appreciate you for all the long days and nights of writing with and for me, for messaging me and letting me talk on voice recordings, for not just hearing me, but actually capturing my voice and making sure it never feels short. I thank you, sister, for that. And I look forward to many more to come. God bless you. I love you. Now, let's get to feeding the soul yes okay so i think that was supposed to have been at the beginning of the book but nonetheless um this was a great read if you have not been able to catch up on them on my instagram which is story time underscore with underscore more am i uh or if you have been watching them on facebook and you'd like to see them in order you can go to my youtube which is my name morgan myers m-o-r-g-a-n-m-y-e-r-s there'll be a red logo with a yellow m inside for more of mine and you can catch up on these along with some other books that i've read by black authors roll of thunder hear my cry by Mildred d taylor uh black boy by richard wright i'm currently reading another book called xenogenesis by octavia e butler it's like some terrestrial and human type stuff is pretty cool um yeah i have a number of reads by black authors on my channel so go check it out thank y'all so much for tuning in and i'll be reading a new book coming up um, by another black author called Centered by Jason Brown. He was a former NFL player turned farmer. Um, I've actually been on his farm. It's in Mooresville, North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. That's the city name. Um, been out there for an event that was going on, and he was giving tours on a tractor. I didn't get to get on it, but he had a book, and I purchased it, and I'm excited to read his story about what made him go from being a football player to being a farmer. So thank y'all again for tuning in, and I'll tune in with y'all again soon. Peace.